Welcome back. In the next two episodes of the series, we'll be focusing on survivorship. What does the road after diagnosis and treatment look like? In what ways have the advances in early detection positively affected the quality of life for cancer survivors? Joining us for this discussion are the familiar voices of Dr. Flavia Roca and Latasha Wilson. You'll also be meeting Dr. Carrie Winter Stone, a professor at the Knight Cancer Institute. But let's get started with Dr. Roca. Someone gets diagnosed and they're able to catch it early enough. Yep. And the treatment can vary based mm-hmm. on you know what's needed in that situation. And then maybe they didn't need to have surgery or they did have surgery. Mm-hmm. What does life with cancer or after cancer look like for a lot of people? Are, are, is it a situation where you have to stay on medication to keep it at bay? Um, are there you know a frequency of checkups, yep. a higher frequency of checkups after that? Yep. Are you kind of like handcuffed to cancer for the rest of your life? No, no, absolutely not. I think, you know, obviously we want to make sure that as physicians, we, uh, we treat your cancer to the full degree. Mm-hmm. So certainly if we're able to catch it early, remove it. And then, as I mentioned, sometimes we give, you have to give you additional therapy to kind of collect the microscopic cells. Okay. Uh, and then we typically enroll you in a, in a surveillance program. And so basically you'd come and see us every three to six months. We may draw some blood, get some more CAT scans or x-rays. Uh, and then we wait. And okay. typically, as I, as I tell my patients, no news is good news, so that if nothing shows up, and the longer you go with nothing showing up, then the better the chances are that this is a permanent cure. Okay. Most cancers, we like to quote the five-year survival rate, because once you reach five years after the, that surveillance, we can say pretty confidently that this, this is the end, and please go and live out your life. Yeah, so I am a professor at the Knight Cancer Institute, um, and my main role there is to do research on cancer survivorship. Okay. So I'm really interested in trying to better understand what are the challenges that people face once they've been diagnosed with cancer all the way through end of life, and then what are the ways that we can, like what are the strategies that we can use to help optimize people's quantity of life, Mm -hmm. certainly part of what treatment's about, but really their quality of life. And then treatment is a whole other phase right. where you know, that's some of the most difficult part. Um, but you also have the full attention of the medical system because everyone's there around you when you're being treated. And then there's this other phase that sometimes is called lost in transition mm. where people move out of the care of their oncologist and they should be moving back to primary care. Mm-hmm. But they get lost because they had so much attention at the time they were being treated. And now everyone rings a bell, give you a high five. Right. And and send you back to your normal life. But your night, life doesn't feel normal anymore. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of attention now trying to be um, given toward that kind of post-treatment mm. phase. And then just to keep going, there are even sometimes some what we call long-term late effects that happen from treatment. So Mm. something that may not pop up until 15, 20 years after you had your treatment so that it's a different medical system that now needs to know, okay, this is someone who's had cancer. They Mm. have more surveillance for their cancer coming back. We need to pay attention to their heart because of some of the treatments they've had. So we really have to kind of keep continuity in care Mm -hmm. across, you know, from the point the imaging comes back um, throughout someone's lifetime. That was Dr. Carrie Winterstone, adding some additional insight to the different phases of treatment. Up next, Latasha shares with us what it was like learning how to provide care for a loved one and advocating on their behalf. Um, I think there's another angle that isn't often discussed, and that is uh, caring for a family member mm-hmm. that may mm-hmm. be you know, experiencing uh, some hardship with cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did lose my grandmother to cancer two years ago, and I didn't know she had cancer Mm. until maybe six months before she passed. That's another thing within Mm. our community, Mm -hmm. the way we just, you know. Don't talk about it. That we just don't talk about it. And my, uh, my youngest brother, he's a physician, and it wasn't until we got a text message from him about three, yeah, around that time period, and he was like, yeah, so... I don't know if you guys know, but this would be a good time to go see grandma. 
So, I, you know, I flew back east for that. But, yeah, we, we're not having these conversations enough. We just aren't. Um, so could you could you speak to, you yeah. know, what it looks like and, and maybe some of the, the difficulties and, and uh, maybe some of the, the things you learned throughout caring for your mother? Mm-hmm. And so I went to the doctor's appointment, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what questions to ask, mm. right? If there's something that you're thinking about, write your questions down, even if it's just your regular doctor's appointment. You know, I actually got this from my, my mother-in-law. And so, you know, I'm actually married to someone who is white. Mm-hmm. And so, and she actually had breast cancer. So we have it on both sides of the family, so which is another reason why I want to make sure that my girls right. um, know what's going on. But I learned things by seeing what he does, or what his mom does, like what they do. Like, it's like, I'm kind of like peeking behind the curtain. Oh, yeah. To see oh, how yeah. things are done. And she's just like, you know, whenever I have an issue, I write down all my questions. And then I go in and I go check, 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 check. Because sometimes they just want to rush you out of there. Yep. Right? And so she said, I want to make sure that I get everything. And I'm like, oh, you could do that? Oh, <laughs> okay. So I started doing that. But when I was in there with my mom, I didn't have any questions. I didn't know this. I didn't know to, to ask any questions. And so she didn't give any information none whatsoever so we didn't even know that she was only given three months to live only three months to live but she ended up living for 15 months okay take a pause right here Mm -hmm. what do you they did not tell you my my mom didn't tell me so going back to the family right they she did not share with us Okay. That she only had three months. So quite familiar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. But yeah, I was like, the did, doctor didn't yeah. tell you what. No, no. <laughs> okay. But the yeah, so there's only so much that I could ask because you know it's my mom's appointment, right. you know, as right. well. And so it was just like I'm just sitting there, and then you know it's kind of like I'm still her daughter, and it's that um, respect factor. Oh yeah. You know, oh, yeah. speak unless you're spoken <laughs> to. You know, kind of <laughs> thing. You know, I was born in the south. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. You know, kind of thing. So. I didn't speak up. I didn't ask the questions and, you know, what can we do, you know, to help prolong as much as possible? Like, are there anything that we can, what are the resources? Where can she, like, what are that? It's just like, there's only one path and this is the only path that you can take. And so I wish I would have known about HOP and the different resources when my mom was going through this. So I always use the example of putting your oxygen mask on first, right? Mm, Right. If you don't put your (laughs) oxygen mask on first, you can't, take care of the people you need to take care of. And that's the most important thing. So I thought, you know what, if I don't want, well, I don't want my kids to have to take care of me like that. So it's my responsibility to really make sure that I'm still as healthy as possible for as long as possible so that they don't have to go through that. But if they do knowing that, you know, I'm hopefully teaching them and saying to them, take care of yourself first. And then come back and take care of mom. Yeah. You know, you know, I we have this little joke because I'm not really great at swimming, <laughs> and so which I put my kids in swim classes and everything. <laughs> and so I'm just like, okay, mom, she can only hold her breath for so long. I said, you know, you guys go swim ahead, go get help, and then come back for mom. Don't <laughs> sit here and try to you right. know drag me along. It's just like you right. know, I'll turn on my back and float. Go get help. Yeah, right. yeah, I would. Just, I will hang on as long as I can. <laughs> but it's just like give him them that permission. Yeah. To leave me behind, go do what you need to do, and then bring back the yeah. help, you know, kind of thing. But we don't talk like that. It's just like sometimes we go down with the with the ship and we're like, oh, we're all drowning together yeah. because we're not taking care of, you know, ourselves while we're trying to take care of our loved ones. There are so many resources, right, out there that are available. And if we don't know, yeah, right, and I always say this, I can't expect someone outside of my community to come into my community to advocate or whatever. Right, right. right? Because you're it's, outside of the community. How how familiar are you with the needs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, in my home, I don't expect someone to come in and take care of my kids. I have to, I have to be the first to step up first. And right. then I go and bring those resources and I let them know about it. And so right. that's, you know, this is, you know, for, you know, as for me and my house, taking care of my house and then expands to my community. And from there, you just keep on going. And hopefully someone either sees me, you know, because sometimes, you know, just seeing someone that looks like you yep. 
on a magazine or a newsletter or something like that, it might make them stop that they might not have otherwise stopped. Like, wait a minute, Ooh, what is she talking about? Right. And then they'll read through and like, oh, this actually pertains to me. Not that the information doesn't pertain to you, but it's just someone that you know that has gone through what you, someone who looks like you ha- that has gone through something similar and there's like, oh my gosh, this could happen to my family. There's a familiarity right. there right. that says that this is not just a white person problem or just a black person problem. It's just a, someone that's familiar to me that I can just like, just to get me to stop and just look and think to pay attention it. and think yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my mom, she was just like, if you got a bad attitude, I don't want you. She's like, this is not a pity party. <laughs> Not a pity party. And right. so she, and I think that's what happened. She wouldn't allow us to feel sorry for her, and which I'm glad, because I think if I would have known that she only had three months, I would have just been, I would have been worried. Of course. And, and so, um, but those are the, the things I think that really, really helped was um, the in-home, you know, care, which I didn't know that there were people who would come to your house. Like, once again, right. I didn't even know that that was even a service right. that was even available um, because, you know, she just wasn't sick enough to be in the hospital. And so she much rather be at home anyway. And so we just wanted to make sure that she was as comfortable as possible. And like I said, and really she was fine until like the last two weeks of her life. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how, uh, you were able to take that experience and, you know, flip it upside down again in your personal life and with your family. And like I mentioned before, and still some of these preventative measures. We rejoin my conversation with Dr. Winter Stone as she talks about the impact of social support. One thing I wanted to also mention is how important I think social support is when people are making big changes Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do in my uh, research, I do a lot of exercise interventions, Mm -hmm. trials where we're testing different kinds of exercise to see if they're helpful for different types of problems and we we always do it in a group okay and we always do it with a leader and there are two reasons for that the group helps people stick together Mm -hmm. and i need people to show up or i can't test my study and then the supervision ensures that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing okay and i you know supervision or having a trainer that sort of thing can be a luxury and it can be unaffordable I think the social support on the other hand is something that people can find or ask for right. or, or or go to. And that there's something that we find really unique about people with cancer exercising with other people with cancer. Okay. And that there's a shared experience that they've had that becomes kind of an unsaid thing. They don't have to talk about it. It's not support group. Yeah. No one yeah. cry. They're, no, no one has They're to be done crying, right? right? But they can exercise, so that's a positive thing. And um, but the person next to them knows exactly what they've been, right. even though they've never met them. Um, one thing that and we're moving toward now, and not all systems have these people embedded in in the healthcare system, are called patient navigators. And so this is someone who was assigned to a patient time they're diagnosed and their job is to really help them navigate them and their family navigate the complexities of insurance and decisions wow and support and finding additional resources so that is definitely a position that we're hoping will be more kind of a standard member of the care team so that people don't have to figure things out on their own it really is a dizzying experience, yeah. I think, for patients and families, and the patients are not feeling well or they're feeling overwhelmed, and um, they, then families have to step in and provide a lot of the care and Mm-mm. aid with decisions, but they feel lost. So yes. you can imagine how yeah. stressful it gets for families. And we close out the episode discussing decisional regret and giving people the tools they need to make the most informed decisions. And most importantly, the need to have the right support in place to positively impact one's quality of life. You used a phrase just now that I, I've never heard before, decisional regret, um, framing some of the challenges. Could you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, well, it's something we don't want to hear. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry that I uh, that I'm this feeling that I'm worse off mm. after my cancer treatment than I was before. Gotcha. And and it's hard because you know now that we're moving towards some of the good things about having patients make their own decision and not mm -hmm. necessarily the doctors make their own decision also comes with the trade off of now you have to choose right <laughs> and the decision mm. and the outcomes of that decision you have you you might feel some degree of ownership over that or you know that it was your decision that mm -hmm. things turned out the way they were so we don't mm. want people to get in a situation where they may face that first by helping people make better informed decisions and giving people the tools they need to make a decision. Right. It's not that easy. Right. Uh, but then also making sure that no matter the outcome, that there's the support in place in order to help people handle some of the side effects and the symptoms and the things that mm. you know, come from treatments and might linger and impact their quality of life. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode of Finding Hope. Cancer Screening is the Future, available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Presented by OHSU Night Cancer Institute. For more information on the OHSU Night Cancer Institute, visit www.ohsu.edu backslash night dash cancer dash institute. And for more details on the Pathfinder 2 study, including eligibility requirements, visit www.ohsu.edu backslash pathfinder dash study.